named after the, a, a mathematician that lived 1500s or 1600s, Rene Descartes. And so that was our area, and we had to just explore uh, this valley with this little car we had. It was a, lunar, uh, a little electric car that was actually folded up and bolted to the outside of the spacecraft. And so when we got onto the moon, we uncovered the car and we're looking at the bottom of the car. And there were two cables, and so we started pulling these cables and this car started moving out from the spacecraft. And when it got out about 45 degrees, the pins pulled out and it and the wheels unfolded like landing gear on an airplane. It just unfolded and there was this car uh, there. So we continued to pull it down and uh, got it down onto the surface uh, and uh, put up the seats, activated the steering, and John drove off. John, the, my commander, was the driver of the car and I was the navigator. So we had trained so that I would navigate us across the moon with a set of maps that they gave us, uh, which weren't very good, of course. They'd been taken from orbit. Uh, and so this map, on this map, you couldn't see anything smaller than 15 meters. Well, there are a lot of big holes that are 10 meters across. And if you come across a ridge, there might be a big hole in front of you. So you had to be careful as you drove. and. Uh, it was like driving on ice. The back end uh, of the car kept uh, uh, going back and forth. We occasionally spun the car out, uh, but we never felt like we were going to turn over. And so uh, to, to get into the car, uh, what I did was just go and hold on to the car, and in my suit, I just did this, and I jumped up and pulled real hard and landed on the seat. <laughs> and in a, in a spacesuit, you cannot do this, and you can't do a knee bend in an Apollo spacesuit. So if you, we look like Frankenstein walking across the moon most of the time <laughs> because it's stiff-legged. You cannot bend your leg like this. The suit's so stiff. So when you land in this seat, you're like this, like straight. And we had a seat belt, and we put it over here, and we just sort of cranked ourselves in until we could look forward and then we could were securely fastened into this car because you'll see in a video as you drive it bounced a lot across the lunar surface it was a, a rough drive but it was fun we set the moon speed record 17 kilometers per hour uh, we drove a total of about 25 kilometers and the farthest they would let us go was five kilometers because uh, you, the car would go 100 kilometers, but if you drove out five kilometers and the car broke down, you had to walk back. Uh, there was no uh, record service. Uh, there was no mechanics. Uh, if you couldn't get it fixed, you abandoned the car and you walked, walked back. And so we felt like we could walk about uh, 15, uh, no, five uh, kilometers was about our maximum. So what we did every day, uh, by the way, we were on the moon for 72 hours, almost. So we divided the three, the 72 hours up into three 24-hour periods. And during that 24-hour periods, we had a, we went, we slept for about, we call it a rest period for eight hours. We woke up, we ate a meal, uh, we suited up, we put our spacesuits on. That took about three hours to get it all checked out. We opened the door, we climbed out, we explored for uh, the longest was seven hours and 45 minutes. We climbed back inside, we took off our suits, uh, we recharged everything so it would be ready to go for the next day. We ate a meal, talked to mission control, and went to sleep. So that was our routine over, uh, on the, uh, while we were up on the, the lunar surface. Uh, the, the maximum time we were outside was seven hours, about 45 minutes, if I recall. The shortest was about five hours and 45 minutes. So over 20 hours we were actually outside exploring this fascinating moonscape. I felt right at home. Uh, there was no, no fear uh, that we had, no sense of danger. Though the moon is a very hostile environment, uh, it's, uh, it, 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 you don't feel that way. 
uh, you're looking at a, 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 a terrain that you had studied from the maps and so you look, okay, there's Stone Mountain here, and there's Smoky Mountain over here, and uh, you couldn't see Plum Crater. This we call Plum Crater, but as we drove across the moon, uh, finally, hey, there's Plum Crater. You can see it on the maps. Uh, and so we felt like we were familiar with our landing area. Uh, when I put on my spacesuit down here on Earth, and with all of my equipment, the life support system on the back, the cameras and every the boots and everything, I weighed, uh, let's see, 170 kilograms. But up on the moon, uh, I divide, you divide by that by six, so it was slightly less than 30 kilograms. So uh, you could bend a little bit and you could jump and uh, you had this springiness about you, so that's why we look like kangaroos sometimes when we go across <laughs> the lunar surface because of the light, uh, the light gravity that we had. Well, I want to show this video, and uh, then I'll have a few anecdotes that uh, I want to uh, talk about, and then we'll have an opportunity uh, for you to ask some questions. I've got some, after the video, I've got some slides, uh, 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 photographs that we can cycle through and uh, you'll get a chance to uh, then get a chance to ask questions. You can see the lunar surface, see the footprints that we had put and you can see around the crater here is a set of footprints that we walked and everywhere you, le you walked on the moon you left your footprints. So you never worried about getting lost. How do you get back? Well, you just turn around and follow your tracks back. And so everywhere we drove the car, we left the tracks. And so uh, it was uh, easy to get back. But we had a navigation system on the rover. We never had to follow our tracks back because of the navigation system. Had we uh, had a, uh, a problem, we could have followed the tracks back. This uh, object here is a shovel. Uh, that we use to collect uh, 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 lunar soils and rocks. It was about the, uh, it was like a little spade uh, to collect the rocks. Uh, so uh, could we uh, get the video up and running, uh, the DVD, uh, if we can? And uh, while he's getting that queued up, uh, I, uh, <coughs> I was going to point out up there the car you saw it went all the way into the lunar surface, which was a surprise. So, and this is how you get up. Uh, you push up, and you do another push up, and I almost make it, and I do another one, and I'm up. So, uh, and uh, I fell down a lot, so I got used to doing that. Uh, we uh, a sample together usually. Here I am with a rake uh, sampling these, uh, uh, the gray lunar soil and I put the sample into this bag that uh, John has. You can see in the background over here there's some white rock off to the upper right. Uh, and, th and that was actually about eight kilometers away. Uh, we were not able to get over that, those rocks, but there was a big crater uh, meteor hit over there and took some rocks over in our side. Now I'm trying to catch this rock, uh, and I don't do a very good job, so I lose that rock, but I'm determined to pick up this rock, so with my little scoop, uh, I uh, get the rock again, uh, and uh, I'm trying to do this by myself, uh, and this time I catch it, but I dropped the bag I was putting it in. <laughs> but I had another bag, so I was uh, okay. This is John Young uh, next to a, a rock that was uh, almost three meters tall. Uh, here I am running back towards the lunar uh, module over here. Uh, we, at, we slept in the upper portion of the lunar module. You can see the flag again, still got the same wrinkles in it uh, that uh, uh, it had when I put it up. Uh, John, uh, is we're, this is our moon Olympics, and here I am going to set the moon record and unfortunately, there I go over backwards. And uh, that was the only moment where I had great fear up on the lunar surface because I was falling on my backpack and if I jarred a piece of the plumbing loose, I was dead. 
Uh, fortunately, the suit was very steady and strong, and John helped me up, but my heart was pounding uh, as I tried to uh, 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 calm down. Uh, fortunately, I was okay, and we were able to leave the car up on the moon. Tonight, this is a picture of my family. Tonight, when you watch Magnificent Desolation over an IMAX, you'll see uh, a simulation of me dropping that picture on the lunar surface. Uh, here's a uh, the, the lift off. We left the car up on the moon. So as I told the folks last night, if you want an $8 million car with a dead battery, there are three of them up on the moon. <laughs> so you, I can tell you exactly where they are. The feeling you could have when you you especially as moonwalker, you watch the moon from the earth. What kind of emotion do you still feel? Uh, today, my uh, my emotions. Uh, the last I was in. Uh, let me start again. Uh, the last full moon we had, uh, I uh, was outside and I looked up and the moon was coming up and and even today, 36 years later, I get this I get this wonderful feeling that I've been there and it's and it still charges me with excitement. Uh, that, that I can, that, that I had this experience. On the other hand, it's still a romantic uh, body to, to me. I look up, Dorothy and I go out, we're at the beach or we're walking together in the evening and look up at the moon and we can still have uh, romantic feelings about it to me. It, so it's, it's on one hand, it's very familiar. On the other side, it's now distant uh, and beautiful. And yet I can recall, uh, you know, the, uh, the, if you will, the harshness of the moon and yet the beauty of the moon. And it's a great feeling to know that our footprints are still there. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah. Okay, I'll try it without a microphone. Um, well, you mentioned um, the Plum Crater and Altra, which were obviously not far away from your sp spacecraft. So how can you make sure when you're uh, actually landing not to hit one of these um, uh, erosions or, or, or une uneven parts of the moon surface. Because uh, when, when, when we see the video, it looked like like a very quick descent. And you were, were uh, basically not seeing actually where you were going. Uh, well, you tell me how that works on and never anything happened. So all those missions uh, landed safely and uh, it seemed somehow unbelievable. Well, uh, in actuality, uh, House Rock was uh, four and a half kilometers from where we landed. Uh, the large the stone mountain was four kilometers away. So our objective was to land in the middle of this valley, almost equidistant between these two large objects that we would eventually explore. And our problem was we were targeted to the middle of this valley, and what we had to do is we came in, by the way, the descent lasted nine and a half minutes from the time you start down till you touch down. And what you saw was the last basically 30 seconds of that nine and a half minutes. So as we came in at about, uh, let's see, it would be about one and a half kilometers, the vehicle part pitches down and we see the landing site for the very first time. And when we begin to estimate where we are in relation to our objective, and we start to maneuver, well, we're a little long, we're a little north, and we start to maneuver, and the closer we get, the, the more detail you begin to see. And so you're trying to find a place that's not without any craters, but without any really big craters. And so uh, we, uh, John, uh, identified a spot and he began to maneuver and you come in and the last uh, 30 meters or so is like a helicopter coming down uh, and I'm calling the altitude off uh, as he's uh, descending and so we touch down and I'm watching out my window that we're not actually drifting into a big a hole a crater on this side and he's monitoring his side and so we touched down and shut down, and we were okay. We actually picked a spot that was level. But that was uh, 
the probability of that happening is, is very high, but uh, when we shut down and the next day we got outside and I went around to the back, we had actually landed within three meters of a big crater behind us that we did not see. Uh, it was it was it was uh, it was shallow uh, and in such a way that uh, that it was invisible to us due to the the way that the shadows were on the moon at this point and so we were very fortunate that we didn't land back there the vehicle would not have turned over but it would have put the experiments package out of my reach it would have been they were up in here and if we landed in this crater, I could not have reached the experiments back, so we were very fortunate. And all of the Apollo had that that problem to, to maneuver in to try to find a spot uh, that was was safe to land in. Okay. Yeah. Uh, questions, uh, Zora. I want to tell one little story, and then we will this uh, program will be over. Uh, it's a personal story uh, of our. Uh, trip. Uh, on the way to the moon, on the second day, uh, Ken Mattingly, uh, the command module pilot, lost his waiting ring. He'd taken his rings off. Uh, we had no showers, uh, no uh, bath facilities on Apollo. So to get clean, you just took off everything. And you're floating there, you took rings, watches, everything off, and you wet, you, you had water and you had a towel, you got a wet towel and just rubbed, rubbed down. And so he had stored his uh, uh, clothing and his ring and watch in a, in a pad, patch on the, uh, a pocket on the side of the spacecraft. Well, when he got finished, he, he started getting dressed and everything was there but his waiting ring, it had floated out and was somewhere in a spacecraft, but we couldn't find it. We journeyed to the moon, and John and I landed on the moon. Three days later, we come back, and now it's the eighth day of the mission, and he's still looking for this ring, and we can't find it. Uh, and so on the way home, we had a spacewalk. Uh, we call it uh, external activity, EVA. Uh, and so we open the door of the spacecraft, Mattingly floats out and goes to the back of the spacecraft down at what we call the service module. I come out and, uh, and I'm making sure he doesn't get entangled and I'm just sitting and just wedged into the hatch with my feet looking down. Over here is the Earth, about uh, 250,000 kilometers. Back over here is the big moon, and it's just fantastic view. So I float back inside, and I'm down at the back of the spacecraft looking out the door. Maddenly comes back, and he goes out three meters and is working on a biological experiment on the, on the end of this three-meter pole. And his back is to me, uh, and, uh, and he's just silhouetted in the sunlight, uh, and hmm. working on this experiment talking to mission control. And as I look over, there's his wedding ring floating out the door. <laughs> and I, I said, there it is. So I reach for it and I miss it and it floats out the door. And we're traveling through space now about, uh, let's see, about 4,800 kilometers per hour. But there's no atmosphere, so everything floats along together. And the only difference in the velocity is this slow movement of this rain. And I'm watching it, and I say, well, lost in space. <laughs> and, uh, but it floated out and hit him on the back of the head about five minutes later. And he's got a round helmet and a round ring. And the probability of that making a 180-degree bounce is almost zero. But that's what happened. <laughs> it hit him on the helmet and started back towards the hatch. Slowly, ever so slowly, it floated back, floated back in the hatch, and I grabbed it. And <laughs> so when it got back, wow.
So when he gets back inside, oh my, in the my glove was his wedding ring. I said, I got something for you. Look at that. And I told him the story. Well, thank you very much for your warm welcome, and I hope you've enjoyed our evening. Thank you. On the 25th of May, 1961, uh, President Kennedy announced we we're going to go to the moon, we're going to land on the moon, and we're going to return safely. Uh, the astronauts uh, appreciate the return safely part. Nobody <laughs> wanted a one-way trip. So uh, I began to dream a little bit about that. Went back to school, uh, got a master's degree, worked on the Apollo Guidance and Navigation System, which was being built by MIT uh, in Boston, uh, and uh, then on the test pilot school. And after I graduated, I realized I was qualified. Uh, and as I was uh, reading the Sunday paper uh, in California, one of the articles was, NASA is seeking more astronauts. Please apply. And so I read the qualifications, and I was qualified, and so I applied and was selected after about an eight-month uh, uh, process. So Dorothy and I moved to uh, Houston, Texas, which is the home of the astronauts, and we began our training. Uh, I, I wasn't very optimistic that I would get a chance to go. Uh, there were only so, uh, so astronauts. However, we had three killed in a fire. Uh, we had four killed in an automobile accident. I mean, one in an automobile accident, and four in airplane accidents. Uh, some of the senior ones. Okay, Houston, I'm on the board. Roger, Neil. Thank you. 